Hello and good morning everyone. This is Dr. Swingle's webcast called It's All in Your Head. And we are here with Dr. Swingle today to discuss brightening and optimizing the aging brain. Not only we all get older, but I think the older we get, the faster it goes. So I'm sure that all of us are eager to know what we can do to minimize declines in brain efficiency as we age. Before I pass it on to Dr. Swingle to tell us all about that, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Swingle. Dr. Swingle was titular full professor of psychology at the University of Ottawa prior to moving to Vancouver. Fellow of the Canadian Psychological Association, Dr. Swingle was lecturer in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, attending psychologist at McLean's Hospital in Boston, where he also was coordinator of the clinical psychophysiology service. Dr. Swingle is registered psychologist in British Columbia, certified in biofeedback and neurotherapy. His newest book, Biofeedback for the Brain, was published by Rutgers University Press, and the book is available at soundhealthproducts.com. Okay, also for you to know, we are going to have two Q&A breaks during this webcast. If you have any questions, I encourage you to send them to me by typing them in the question or chat window on the control panel on the right side of your screen. You can do so anytime from the start of this webcast to our second Q&A break. And we are ready to get the show started, so let me welcome Dr. Paul Swingle. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, as uh, Rita said, the topic today is brightening and optimizing the aging brain. And I find that as I get older, <coughs> I'm having an increased amount of interest in this topic. My septuagenarian brain <coughs> can use all the brightening and optimizing it can get. There are a number of issues here. Uh, when I was in Ottawa, I treated a lot of individuals who worked for the government. And uh, I'm thinking particularly of men who uh, really did not like what they were doing. They were bored with it. They didn't like the bureaucracy and so forth and so on. <clears throat> and it became perfectly obvious that if they didn't have something to retire into, the lights went out in 18 months, and it was highly predictable. And there is there are data that to substantiate this observation. So one of the critical elements is that we want to make sure that we're not retiring out of something, but into something. So that's a very, very critical element. And uh, I had a startling example of how people misperceive that, that concept. Uh, I asked one person, did he have anything that he was going to be doing, involved in, uh, to uh, occupy himself when he retired? And he said, oh, yes, he has a hobby. And I asked him what it was, and he said it was wine collection. Now, I have a difficulty understanding how that might occupy you. I see you could spend uh, days sitting in your wine cellar, I suppose. But that really... Uh, registered with me that uh, the how critical it is that it when you retire at various uh, stages is, uh, of uh, your getting older that you want to think of this as chapter two chapter three chapter four of the book of life okay so we're going to be talking about cognitive inefficiencies and how we uh, prevent these or <coughs> correct them uh, age-related declines, there's nothing inevitable about a lot of this. Yet there are a lot of things we can do that uh, really keep the brain nice and bright and functional. <clears throat> the factors in age-related decline, first genetics, uh, and there is a heritable uh, uh, property associated with aging. Uh, if you have the right kind of genes, then uh, the likelihood of uh, longevity is affected by that. Trauma is a big issue. I'm talking about emotional trauma now. And how do you handle that <coughs> uh, and uh, deal with the 
uh, sequelae, the uh, effects of having been exposed to severe emotional stressors. Now, we've all been exposed to severe emotional stressors. The issue is how do we deal with them? <clears throat> Traumatic brain injury is a big issue. Uh, we all have had bumps on the head, and very often they're ignored, uh, particularly in young children. <clears throat> and a uh, brain injury that you've had 20, 30, even 40 years ago <clears throat> can come back to haunt you if you have a very minor uh, uh, wrap on the head uh, or a serious viral infection, for example. <clears throat> Emotional dysregulation is a big issue. <clears throat> Some very, very interesting data on how mood state modifies your ability to tolerate stress. There's some interesting new research that uh, they did fairly recently with the uh, Vienna, no, I think it was Austrian, uh, uh, Philharmonic, <clears throat> and uh, the effects of positive mood on stress tolerance. A disease, of course, is a big, big issue. And activity, and I'm going to be really stressing this over and over and over again. Activity is the fundamental issue associated with, with uh, uh, efficient aging. Now, I'm going to uh, suggest a metaphor. <clears throat> Uh, when I was in graduate school, we used to joke with one another, the students that is, would joke with one another about what we call Bubba psychology. And Bubba is a term for grandmother. And we always used to say, if we can't figure something out, just ask your grandmother. And she'll give you the proper answer. Well, a lot of this has to do with aging. If we would follow what our grandmothers told us, and you'll see how this plays out, this metaphor plays out, then our ability to maintain bright and sharp brain as we age is markedly facilitated. Recipes for rapid cognitive decline. Have lots of salt and sit on the sofa watching TV eating eating uh, potato chips. And, uh, a inactive life style behavior shortens your life expectancy. And there are compelling, compelling studies of this. The risk for mortality, for example, is 45% higher for individuals that sit more than six hours a day compared with less than three hours a day. So watching TV, very good uh, way to uh, shorten your life expectancy. And watching TV for less than two hours a day increases life expectancy by an average of 1.4 years. This is the British Medical Journal. Slow walking elders, <coughs> mean age 74 and over 2,000 individuals involved in this study, fast walkers, and you can see they're about 75 feet in uh, 30 seconds. And they just follow it up seven years later. Uh, of that entire group, 25% of this group had died. Remember, they're 74 years age, and seven years later, they'd be average age uh, 81. Uh, and deaths were almost three times greater among the slow walkers. And this is the archives of internal medicine. Uh, walking speed, depression, and myocardial infarction uh, risk. And here again, 700 uh, individuals, and they, I love this, <laughs> the young group, 70, <laughs> and the older group uh, in their 80s. Uh, <clears throat> Those, uh, uh, the uh, issue associated with uh, individuals who walk slowly uh, had poor visual acuity and had history of depression were high, at highest risk for uh, <coughs> the uh, myocardial infarction. So again, this is the American uh, Journal of Geriatric Psychiatry. Okay, so activity, action, movement, motion, bustle, hullabaloo, commotion, doing things, going on. Keep active. That's the bottom line. 
And just as an aside, one of the issues we are extremely worried about with uh, the digital age with our kids is they're not out running, playing in the, <coughs> the uh, playground, climbing trees. And uh, that has a huge, absolutely huge uh, impact on the mood state, the uh, development, and so forth. And it's certainly true <coughs> with us seniors. Uh, getting hooked and addicted to the internet, and number one issue uh, in terms of uh, reducing quality of life, if not life expectancy itself. Okay, this is a typical kind of client that we get. This is a 77-year-old man who comes in and he was complaining about memory uh, issues. And these are the data that we get when we do a brain assessment, which I'll go over in detail with you. And what I'm doing is circling here the uh, areas that are a flag for me. And I'll just summarize what I'm seeing here, and then we'll look at it in more detail. The first thing I'm seeing is that this individual has insufficient slow frequency brainwave amplitude in the back of the brain. That's usually a problem associated with sleep quality. Now sleep is a huge issue with elderly and <coughs> mental and uh, cognitive efficiency. We'll go over that in detail. The second is he's got a marker for depression, and depression again is huge in terms of not only quality of life, for the uh, elderly, <coughs> excuse me, but also factors like health. Compelling evidence in terms of the relationship of depression uh, and uh, good health. And third, he has what we call slowing of alpha, which is the number one uh, issue associated with age-related decline. Our cognitive efficiency just gets sluggish, and this individual has a marker for that in which there's the uh, alpha frequencies in the brain are getting slower, meaning translation, the brain is less efficient. Now, if we're looking at the brain in this particular individual, <coughs> what we're concerned about is the balance in the front part of the brain. What you're looking at here, this is the right side of the front part of the brain. And the individual that we were just looking at, what I found when I did a brain assessment on the individual is this side of the brain was more active than the left side. And that's a marker for uh, predisposition to depressed mood states. Now depression, as you all know, uh, has a lot of uh, factors. A, obviously it reduces the quality of life. Second is it deprives you of motivation. Third, it has health implications. And fourth, it implicates how efficiently you process stress. The second thing that I found with this individual is there was what we call, again, alpha slowing, <clears throat> meaning that the, the brain's ability to get from one state to another, transfer information and so forth, becomes sluggish. A lot of factors affect that. Drugs affect it. I'm talking about prescription medications now. Sleep quality affects it, etc. And we'll go over that in some detail. And the other thing that I noticed with this individual had to do with the back of the brain, the occipital region in the brain, as it's called. And what I found was that there was insufficient slow frequency amplitude in the back of the brain, particularly under eyes closed conditions. Now what that tends to be related to is a lot of chatter in the, in the brain poor stress tolerance, predisposition to anxiety, and in this particular case, I was particularly worried about sleep quality. If you don't have sleep, good sleep quality, everything negative accelerates, period. Now, this is what a printout looks like when we're doing a brain assessment, the brainwave assessment on an individual, which is the first thing we do with all clients who walk in the door. We do a very, very quick 
uh, it requires about seven minutes of recording time. We record the brainwave activity at five locations in the brain, three of which I just uh, discussed with you. And we get a printout. <laughs> and the printout, we know what the brain should look like. Uh, and, and we have databases in which we can compare the, the brain activity of the client versus <coughs> uh, databases of uh, hundreds, in some cases thousands of individuals. So we have an idea of what is an anomalous brainwave activity. And in this case, what I'm seeing particularly with this individual is first of all a sleep disturbance and in the back of the brain, see this is red highlighted here, uh, he, this individual has the marker for poor uh, quality sleep. Secondarily, <coughs> foggy thinking, <coughs> excuse me, uh, what this individual has is it takes a long time for the brain to get from one state to another. That's this red highlighting here, okay? and the individual is talking about being depressed. And here we have it again in which the right side of the brain is more active than the left. So this is the person's self-report and the data that I'm showing you here is what the brain is telling me and it's bang on. Uh, so we get to the point where we don't ask individuals to tell us why they're here because the brain tells us why you're sitting in front of us. And it's extremely efficient. Not, not only does it tell us why you're here, but it tells us where to go to fix it. Now this is what I mean by an alpha response. And let's say that this is the alpha activity in the brain. That's a brain wave. When I put an electrode on, I'm going to see uh, a waveform that's looking like this. <coughs> Uh, we filter out all the other stuff, of course. Then I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. And what it should look like is alpha should gain strength immediately because you're shutting off the visual cortex. Then as soon as I ask you to eyes open, the alpha amplitude should drop like a rock. That's what it should look like. As we get older, the uh, excursion rate, that is the onset, is very slow. So it takes a long time to get up to its max. And then when you finally open your eyes, you get the exactly the same thing on the other side. And, and that's what these red marks here are telling me. It takes a long time to get up there, and it takes a long time to get back. Now this is what an alpha response should look like in the brain. Now alpha is sitting right in this range here in the <coughs> light blue area. And what you're going to find is when the individual closes her eyes, the alpha is going to jump. Now what we're looking at here is called the spectral display of the brain where we have very slow frequencies over on the left. There we go, there's the alpha. See, the eyes close, nice jump in alpha, and as soon as she opens her eyes, it'll drop like a rock. And it's coming up right around now. There it is. That's what it should look like. Now, a lot of things will slow down your alpha, and one of the major, major problems we have, full anesthetics. Now, full anesthetics are bad news for infants. We used to think that you get away with one full anesthetic with a young uh, infant. That's not true. You get the legacy of full anesthetics. <coughs> and here's your marker for the slowing. Uh, when she first came in for treatment, she was sitting up around 4. We went up below 1.5. So we did a couple of treatments and got it down to around 2. She then had the surgeries and the second very, very negative effect on uh, alpha efficiency, <coughs> excuse me, are painkillers. And there's trazid, uh, there's uh, Tremoset and oxycodone and hypermorphin and so forth and so on, all of these markedly slow down the brain. That's why they work. So she uh, was way back up again because of the anesthetics and because of the uh, 
uh, oxycodone, which is highly addictive, by the way. So we did some more treatments, and <clears throat> we brought it back down to uh, 2.1. She did continuing treatment and brought it even lower. But this just gives you an idea of the value of doing a brain assessment. When you feel like uh, things are foggy, you come in and you have a look. Is, it, is the brain neurologically foggy? Okay, it's not all bad news as we get old. As you get older, you become wiser. And there's compelling evidence for this. And wisdom. And it's pattern recognition. You've seen it all before. You know what the excursion is going to look like. That is how this thing is going to play out. You've seen it. You have experience with it. And you have experience with what works and what doesn't. The other is quiescence. You know, you've seen it all before. You don't get all upset about it, hopefully. Now, I see a lot of very, very sharp older folks. Uh, and they suffer from what, I'm trying to think of the fellow's name who would, uh, who, uh, uh, came up with this uh, this metaphor, the Einstein phenomenon. What we mean by this is, if Einstein came in and sat in front of me and said, "I'm becoming forgetful," everybody around him would not know what he's talking about, okay? Because his brain efficiency is so extraordinarily high to begin with, and that if he loses 10 percent, it's not going to be noticeable to anyone but him. And we get a lot of folks coming in where their relatives and friends and spouses and so forth will say, no, no, sharp as a tack. But the person knows. He knows that he's losing a little something here. Now, depression and anxiety are the number, are, are, are very seriously implicated in terms of not only quality of life, but health, well-being, and longevity. And <clears throat> depression and anxiety, the reason I've combined these is a lot of individuals have a condition of severe anxiety that is very poor stress tolerance. They go to the physician and they describe their behavior. I feel hopeless, I can't get anything done, I'm really unhappy. They define it as depression and they treat it with antidepressants. Bad news, because it's not depression as we understand it in a neurological context. What it is, is this individual has severe anxiety, can't cope and feels hopeless uh, because of not being able to cope with anxiety. That's a very different animal. Depression refers to what I showed you earlier in which one side of the brain is more active than the other and there are lots of ways that can happen. So here's what depression looks like and I showed you this in the very first example of the 77 year old man who came in. He had the same condition and that is where the right, F4 is the right front side of the brain and beta is the very fast activity in the brain. So the strength of beta in the right frontal cortex is 58.6 percent greater than in the left. That's your marker for predisposition to depression and depression has huge implications. One of which, and this is particularly problematic with young teenagers, is that it deprives you of motivation. Now, you may not have any frank sadness, you just may not have energy. You know, there's that old statement about as you get older, my God, get up and go, got up and left. <laughs> okay? That can be a property of depressed mood states. And again, Here's the culprit in depression, where this side of the brain is more active than this side. And again, there are a lot of ways that can happen, and we find all of them when we do a brain assessment. One of the things you can do if you experience seasonal affective disorder uh, is you can 
use light boxes. A lot of people, there's a lot of data on successful uh, effects of uh, light boxes. Uh, what we do is we use <coughs> glasses in which the lights are in the periphery of the frame. So you can look through these glasses. You can put them on as soon as you get up in the morning. So you're wearing your light box. And at this time of year, this can be very, very efficient for uh, helping with depressed mood states. <coughs> now the anxiety pattern is pretty different from the uh, depression pattern. The anxiety pattern, and I showed you this again uh, in the very first case in which in the back of the brain, O1 is the back of the brain, the occipital region in the brain that we were looking at earlier. <clears throat> there's not enough slow frequency back there. So I know this individual has <clears throat> problems associated with chatter in the brain, uh, uh, poor stress tolerance, predisposition to anxiety, sleep quality problems, and a propensity for self-medicating behavior, and that's the risky one. And self-medicating can be alcohol, it can be cigarettes, it can be the internet, <clears throat> it can be sleep, or it can be uh, addiction to prescription medication. And that is a huge problem in our culture, absolutely huge. And here's your anxiety, at least one of the uh, markers for it, which there's a deficiency in slow frequency in the back of the brain relative to the faster frequency. And if you look at a brain map, this is what it looks like. Here we have excessive slow frequency over on the left side of the brain, which means the right's more active than the left. So there's your marker for depression. You can see it. And the second thing is too much fast activity, 15 to 30 cycles a second, too much in the back of the brain. So here we have a person with depression and anxiety, a common combination. So again, depression, the right side is more active than the left, and that can be because there's too much fast activity here or too much slow activity here. Secondarily, the anxiety marker, or one of them, is where there's not enough slow frequency or too much fast track activity back here. We see that instantly when we do a brain assessment. Thank you, Dr. Swingle, and this is going to be our first Q&A break. We do have a few questions here. Can you explain a little more the low-high alpha ratio? Yes. Alpha are brain waves that range between 8 and 12 cycles a second. They're very slow brain waves, and, uh, and it has a sinusoidal kind of look, a nice, smooth uh, uh, waveform. Now, what we mean by brain uh, alpha slowing or brainwave slowing is you look at the peak between 8 and 12 cycles a second. That is, what, what uh, frequency on average has the, the greatest strength. And you'll find that as you age, <laughs> you, the peak frequency that is, the brain wave that has the highest amplitude slows down. So it might start at 10, then it goes to 9.5, then down to 9.2, and so forth. There's another way of measuring this, and it's the ratio in which we look at the strength of brain waves between 8 and 9 cycles a second, and the strength of brain waves 11 to 12 cycles a second, and we get a ratio. We want that ratio of the amplitude or strength of 8 to 9 divided by 11 to 12 to be below 1.5. And that correlates with peak frequency. It's just another way of measuring it that's sometimes more useful for uh, when we're doing treatment. Can patients with seizures use the light frame glasses? And constant light typically is not a problem with uh, uh, seizure issues. It uh, is uh, pulsing light that is usually the problem. Uh, 
However, there are some circumstances in which neurologists are, are cautious about using very bright lights. Now, the uh, light frames that we use are not as bright as the uh, light, light uh, boxes. The light boxes are at 10,000 lumens and, you know, they're extremely bright, as you probably know. Uh, these are a bit, uh, a lot less uh, bright, but they're very close to your eyes and you're wearing them all the time, so you don't have to be oriented toward the light box. Uh, I think it's reasonable to say that uh, uh, constant light is not a serious risk factor, but if you're photosensitive, uh, then I would consult with your neurologist before I did anything with regard to that. Is deficient slow wave in the back of the brain strictly, uh, I'm sorry, I just got another question here, uh, here. Is deficient slow wave in the back of the brain strictly limited to the theta band or can delta and low alpha deficiency be implicated as well? They have different meaning. Uh, when we're looking at the markers for anxiety, then we're looking at the ratio of slow to fast. That is, the amplitude of uh, 3 to 7 cycle a second theta and divided by the amplitude of beta, which uh, in our case is 16 to 25 cycles a second. <clears throat> now, slow delta uh, there can be a problem if you have not enough delta. As you say, delta can uh, have a quieting effect, but there's a very, very serious problem if you have excessive delta. So delta is a different kind of mechanism in the brain. Uh, alpha, if you're deficient in alpha, uh, that has other implications. That's usually a, a person who's been exposed to very severe emotional stressors. If you're interested in that, I would recommend that you go to the website and click on the webinar that uh, the topic was the treatment of emotional trauma, and that will go over in detail uh, the properties associated with deficient alpha, not only at the back of the brain, the occipital region, uh, region but also over the sensory motor cortex that is right on top of the brain. Do you work with people with dementia and Alzheimer's, and do you use the clinical Q or a full Q EEG? And I'm just going to add Dr. Swingle for those people who are not familiar with clinical Q or full Q EEG, if you could maybe go over that a little bit. Sure. When you're doing a brain assessment, you can look at very specific sites, which we call the clinical Q. What we look at are five important sites in the brain, and we use this for 80% oh, of the clients who come in who are experiencing sleep problems or depression or anxiety, you know, those kinds of issues that we can take care of pretty readily. Uh, if we're concerned about things like Alzheimer's, uh, dementia that uh, has a peculiar look when we're doing the clinical cue, traumatic brain injury, uh, seizure disorders and so forth, autism, we always do a full brain map and that is where we look at all 19 sites on the head simultaneously. Now, simultaneously is the key word here because what it's allowing us to do is see how the brain's talking to itself. And when you have issues of dementia and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and so forth, the issue is not necessarily if one area of the brain is more active than the other. The issue is how is that area of the brain talking to other areas of the brain. And there we have very uh, sophisticated databases that help us understand if the area of the brain is either not uh, communicating efficiently or if there's over communication, that is if they're too highly related. Seizure disorder often is a spreading phenomenon in which one area of the brain that shouldn't be talking to other areas of the brain uh, are, that is they're connected and you're getting a spreading of uh, brain uh, activity that gives rise to seizure. And we are going to take the last question now. Um, we are going to be answering the rest uh, during our second Q&A break. Has brain testing been done on marijuana either positive or negative results? 
Yes, <clears throat> there's a ton of research on uh, use on uh, brain activity associated with ma marijuana. Uh, individuals who are recreationally using marijuana on a daily basis, what it's doing is it's increasing the uh, the uh, slowing of alpha. Uh, that's why you get the high, you get uh, a uh, marked increase in the amplitude of very slow alpha. Uh, there are all kinds of issues associated with this, issues associated with the potency, the uh, composition of the various uh, uh, aspects of the uh, marijuana and so forth, like medical marijuana where they extract only certain portions of it that have pain-killing properties but not uh, properties associated with the uh, marijuana high. So there are a lot of issues here. Bottom line, if you are under 25 years of age, every puff is having a negative effect on your brain functioning. So I'm really from the old school. If your teenager is smoking marijuana, you want to come down hard on that because it has long-term consequences. And it ain't too hot for uh, the elderly either. We have enough tri problems keeping our brain waves working okay. We don't need anything going against us. It's like any other drug. Thank you, Dr. Spengel. We are going to move on now. Okay, healthy lifestyle. Now, remember, <coughs> we're going to uh, use the grandma metaphor. So uh, not too much salt. Uh, get up and uh, go climb a tree, uh, healthy lifestyle, okay, <clears throat> smoking, of course, physical activity, of course, and what we're talking about here is taking part in one or more leisure activities, good social network, mean survival five years greater than though with no leisure activities and poor social network, okay. Physical activity, walking, swimming, running, gymnastics, and so forth. <clears throat> Again, regularly engaged in these activities had a median age uh, two years uh, older than participants who did not. So if we're starting to fo follow grandma's rules here, <clears throat> then we're all going to live to, I don't know, 200 years of age maybe. <laughs> Again, this is British Medical Journal Research. Okay. Poor sleep quality, this is a biggie, a real big problem with uh, folks as we get older. Now, there are two aspects of sleep that are of particular concern to us with regard to age-related declines. And the first is deep sleep, and the second is REM. REM means rapid eye movement, that's when you're dreaming. Now. Deep sleep is when the body takes care of itself. Uh, it's when the muscles repair, when you get uh, 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 issues associated with growth and development, boosting the immune system, uh, removal of toxins and so forth and so on. You need about one hour of deep wave sleep a night. Now the problem with deep wave sleep is it takes a little time to get there and very often the elderly, <coughs> folks my age, uh, are deficient in deep wave sleep and that has huge damaging effects. And the second is you need about two hours of REM. Now deep wave renews the body, REM renews the mind. Now, REM sleep has two very important properties. The first is it is when the, the brain does all its filing. The brain consolidates, processes information learned during the day, <coughs> forms the neural connections necessary to strengthen memory. I get a lot of college kids come in and say, I don't know what's wrong. I study, I knew it cold the night before, the next morning it wasn't there. Problem, no deep REM sleep <coughs> or a very, a very poor REM sleep. The second important property of REM sleep is that's when you do your own psychotherapy. Now, as we were evolving, we did not evolve in which we developed a need for psychologists. And what we did was we evolved in terms of developing our own internal psychotherapeutic mechanism. And that's what REM sleep is all about. 
uh, that's when you process all the emotional trauma and emotional stuff going on during the day, good and bad. And we do a lot of work with uh, individuals with post-traumatic stress disorder and other, you know, uh, essential exhaustion issues, uh, poor uh, uh, processing of uh, emotional uh, uh, experience and so forth. Inevitably, there's a REM deficiency. So we have to pay attention to the sleep architecture in addition to doing any psychotherapy that we may do or brain neurotherapy for individuals with post-traumatic stress disorder. We monitor it. We give you a monitor to take home where we're actually measuring brain activity for over a, usually a four-night uh, period so we get a good idea of its stability, of reliability. Is this really what your, your sleep looks like? This is much more efficient than the hospital four-hour uh, snapshot uh, in a strange environment. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's far more efficient than the motion detectors. You know, you buy these uh, bracelets that you put on, and what they're doing is they're measuring movement. So uh, it does correlate with issues like uh, when you're asleep, you're less likely to be rolling around. And deep sleep is a little different than light sleep and so forth. But this is actually measuring brain activity. Here's efficient sleep. <coughs> the red is wake time, uh, the gray is light sleep, but the biggies are deep wave, that's black, and green, which is REM. You need about an hour of deep, here's 55 minutes, and you need about two hours of REM, here's two hours and seven minutes. So this is what we would call efficient sleep, and it's about seven hours. Now, one of the big problems we have with the elderly is oversleep. You should be sleeping in the range of six to eight hours. If you're sleeping more than that, it can be a very serious problem. <clears throat> uh, the elderly get into this taking naps, and the more they sleep, the more tired they become. And that's the fastest way to turn out the lights. Now, sleep is one of the things we want to find out is how your cortisol recovery is. Cortisol is a stress hormone. And it's kind of like filling up a gas tank. You fill up a gas tank with cortisol, and there are a variety of uh, other uh, uh, mechanisms in the brain that, uh, that give rise to release of cortisol. Uh, the sleep uh, cycle is when you are filling up the gas tank, and during the day there's a depletion of the cortisol as the body is making use of that uh, for stress tolerance. And here you can see that when this person woke up in the morning, uh, the gas tank is really full. Okay, this is the usual range, so a lot of uh, cortisol. By noontime, this individual has used a huge amount of their cortisol. Now, this is an extremely active person with a very, very stressful kind of uh, work situation. By the end of the day, the gas tank is empty. Uh, put your feet up on the uh, coffee table, watch a little TV, etc. <coughs> read, talk, listen to music. Uh, it starts to, the gas tank starts to fill up a little bit, but then efficient sleep, bang, <clears throat> gas tank full. Now, by the way, when I talk about things like uh, activities like listening to music, what I mean by that is not having music on in the background while you're washing dishes. Okay? You may want to do that, and there's nothing wrong with it. <clears throat> but if you're using music as a relaxation fill your gas tank kind of activity, then you're doing nothing else but listening to music. A lot of us have lost that ability to do that. Okay, deficient REM. This is what it looks like. This person has 39 minutes of waking time, a lot of waking time, five hours of sleep, not enough, no REM, 19 minutes. 
and that's just not going to cut it. <clears throat> so this person has huge problems in terms of processing emotional trauma. Deep wave sleeps okay, has 57 minutes. Here's the reverse, no deep. <clears throat> Again, five and a half hours. REM's okay, you know, we've got the two hours of REM. He's awake for an hour, hour and a half out of, <clears throat> you know, this time. Uh, the total amount of sleep, not counting this, is uh, 5 hours and 35, uh, 37 minutes. So this is very poor sleep. But it's the REM deficient, and, uh, I'm sorry, the deep wave deficient where REM's okay, where the previous one was the reverse. Deep was okay, but no REM. This is what <clears throat> it looks like when we're assessing uh, uh, sleep issues. Uh, when we're doing the uh, brain assessments. And now this is, uh, what you're looking at here are 11 measurements. Each one, each measurement is 15 seconds. And here the individual has his eyes, uh, her eyes closed. So, I'm sorry, eyes open. So eyes open, eyes open, eyes open. Then eyes closed. Now beta is a very fast waveform. And what you want to see is when you close your eyes, you do not want to see the brain suddenly deciding this is a very good time to start to worry about things. And that's what's going on here. As soon as the eyes are closed, the brain is putting out huge amounts, huge amplitude of beta activity. So the brain lights up, eyes closed. There's your cardinal marker for a sleep disturbance. Doesn't tell you what type but tells us a sleep disturbance. And here's what sleep onset looks like. <clears throat> uh, you find that alpha starts to increase, then alpha starts to decrease, then uh, beta comes down. You have uh, alpha decrease uh, with increasing alpha, then alpha decreases, then theta comes up and beta drops. So that's the kind of what sleep looks like. But the point that I'm making here is uh, you'll notice that sleep is associated with decrease in beta amplitude, and if you have a situation as soon as you close your eyes, beta jumps, you know, skyrockets, of course you're going to have problems falling asleep. Oh, here's grandma again. <laughs> Walk. You know, if you have the option of walking two blocks or driving two blocks, grandma was very, very emphatic about it. Walk is what you want to do. And you want to walk fast, as fast as you can. So walking speed and dementia. <clears throat> Again, they're looking at over a thousand individuals and they're, uh, these are outpatients at a memory clinic and they divided it into uh, individuals who <coughs> had various <coughs> types of, uh, of uh, cognitive impairments. <coughs> and what they found was that uh, the gait slowed as cognitive impairment progressed. So <coughs> if uh, you are uh, looking at uh, walking speed, which we looked at very early on in the lecture, if you remember, <coughs> walking speed <coughs> directly related to all kinds of things, and in this case is directly related to dementia. And <coughs> this was uh, research that was presented in 2012 at the Alzheimer Association conference. Uh, again, sample of 120 adults with and without dementia, uh, striking effect. Uh, those in the walking group had 2% increase in the uh, area of the brain uh, associated with memory and uh, integration of uh, emotional content in memory. Uh, and in the other group, it was a 1.5% decrease. Very, very striking. Again, this was presented at the same conference. Now, what we do is we give uh, individuals a pedometer, and you can buy these at any uh, drugstore. Uh, we sell them, too, on the, the uh, website. And basically, an active person is 10,000 or more steps a day. An inactive person is under 5,000. But this can give you a mechanism for or recording uh, 
your uh, walking speed, <coughs> excuse me, you can uh, convert it to either kilometers or actual steps uh, and time it. And you also use it as a biofeedback device. You put it on when you get out of bed in the morning and you look at it when you go to bed at night and you just write down in your little diary how many steps you took. 10,000 steps is an active person. It's not all that much. It sounds huge, but uh, you would be very surprised how much, uh, you know, if you get yourself off the couch, <coughs> uh, you're not going to get any uh, activity on the pedometer moving around by grabbing the uh, bowl of potato chips. It's not going to happen. And your grandmother always told you this, didn't they? Stand up straight. And we have data on this. <laughs> individuals in a slouched walk, uh, individuals of uh, self-rated depression, <clears throat> slouch walk increases it. So <clears throat> walk, walk fast, stand up straight while you're walking. Doesn't that sound like grandma talking to you? OK, <clears throat> my other favorite. Uh, uh, concept here is uh, reading. I'm very down on the use of gaming as a cognitive training procedure. We don't have any reasonable evidence that it's at all effective other than uh, increasing your skill level relative to the test that they give you as part of the assessment. We do know <coughs> that individuals who read uh, and participate in the crafts <coughs> uh, have a nice decrease in the risk of developing mild cognitive impairment. Now, uh, computer activities, it depends on what the activity is. If you're doing, uh, you know, information searches for a project, of course, I mean, that uh, is uh, cognitively, cognitively very beneficial. But the bottom line is, you know, you're counting the number of steps you do, uh, uh, how much television are you watching, how much reading are you doing. And here the uh, data are very, very clear. Individuals who watch television less than seven hours a day were 50% less likely to develop myocardial infarction. Okay. So <clears throat> it's not a trivial issue. Activity, activity, activity. And for cognitive processing, read, read, read. Okay, thank you, Dr. Swingle. I'm looking at the time and we'll be able to answer two questions. Now, for the questions that will remain unanswered, feel free to send them to me by email. My email address is on the slide, on the bottom of the slide uh, at the moment. It's rita at swingleclinic.com and I'll be happy to send you the answers after the webcast. Okay, so the first question is, is there a particular neurofeedback approach to enhance cognitive efficiency in reasonably healthy elder? Oh yeah, there are a lot of things that <clears throat> we can do. Uh, above and beyond what we've just been talking about here, uh, there are uh, harmonics that you can use while you're reading that will speed up alpha. Uh, in terms of the neurofeedback, it's very straightforward. What we do is we optimize the alpha responses and make sure that we take care of what we call a foundation. If you have predisposition to depression or anxiety, we take care of that and then we optimize on top of it. It's exactly what we do for Olympic athletes, exactly the same protocol. <clears throat> so that first order of business is make sure that you're not predisposed to depressed mood states and anxiety, your sleep is okay, then on top of that we speed up the alpha, exactly what we do for uh, an elite athlete. And the second question, does alcohol do the same damage to your brain like drugs? Yes. <clears throat> now, having a glass of wine a day, that's no big deal. <clears throat> 
but individuals who uh, are very blind and defensive about alcohol use. And you get over uh, one glass for a female, two glasses for a male, I'm talking about four ounces of wine now, you know, <laughs> and then you're going to start to see the effects. I mean, it's that simple. Thank you. And for, for pregnant women, zero. <clears throat> and there's compelling evidence for that. Thank you. And let's move on. Brain driving. Okay. Now, there are two uh, types of uh, uh, brain activity, brain uh, uh, neurotherapy that we do. One is brainwave biofeedback. That's the one most people are familiar with, in which we set it up so that when the brain is doing what we want it to do with regard to brainwave activity, then you see something move on the computer screen. So kind of like playing a video game with your brain. <clears throat> or you'll hear a tone if your eyes are closed, and you try to keep the tone on or off. Uh, and uh, the brain learns how to become more efficient uh, with that process. Now, brain driving is a more aggressive procedure. And brain driving, uh, what we're doing is we are looking at various aspects of brain activity. So in this case, we may want to do something with uh, say too much slow frequency over here on the left. So we would be measuring that and every time that frequency got too high, we would uh, stimulate the individual with lights or with sounds or with microamperage stimulation of acupuncture points and so forth that we know has an effect on this. So what we're doing is driving it down every time it crosses threshold. And this is just like Pavlov and his dogs in terms of classical conditioning of a brain activity. Uh, and so we might be working with something like alpha, for example, either increasing or decreasing it. Now, here's a, an example of change in brain activity associated with what's called classical conditioning. Again, think Pavlov and his dogs. And here's sound, and here's light, and this is alpha. Now, when you turn a sound on, nothing in particular happens to alpha. When you turn a light on, you get a suppression of alpha. Now, if you pair them, put them together, soon the sound acquires the capability to suppress alpha, even though it did not at the beginning. It was not an unconditioned stimulus for alpha suppression. So we use the same concept for brain driving. And the lights are very similar to the lights I was talking about earlier, though these are controlled directly by brain activity. So the lights are in the periphery of these frames, and we can turn them on and off as we need. And the individual here, uh, there are the lights, here's the sound, here's the stimulation of acupuncture points, and this person has control of the amplitude, so they can set it at a comfortable level. And brain driving, here's that low high alpha ratio that somebody asked about earlier, and this is, uh, uh, this is much too high, and this is an individual said he couldn't focus. <clears throat> and after a 20-minute session, you can see there's a huge decrease in that low-high alpha ratio, and that's using brain driving. Every time uh, <clears throat> slow alpha uh, went above a training threshold, we would turn on <clears throat> lights and sound to drive it down. And you can see it went from roughly 14 down to roughly 10, so a huge decrease. And the good alpha, if we can call it that, went from roughly 5 to roughly 5 and a half again. And here's the ratio, so huge impact using brain driving. This is just one single session. You could do it in the back of the brain too. Remember the back of the brain, the theta beta ratio is associated with quieting. So here we go, deficient in the beginning. And it's up in normal range at the end of a 20-minute session. See so a nice increase in that theta amplitude and a nice decrease in that beta amplitude. And we were using, again, light and sound. And in this case, an acupuncture point as well. So 
If uh, you have too much activity in this part of the brain, we can set it up so we classically condition the brain so that it's balanced and we can treat depression in that way. Uh, the one I just showed you, we will go in, in the back of the brain, increasing the theta-beta ratio for sleep and stress tolerance. And speeding up alpha, we can do it anywhere in the brain because we want alpha nice and fast all over. <clears throat> Medication, there's just no two ways about it. If you are heavily medicated, the brain is sluggish. Now, I showed you the what we can do in 20-minute uh, session. Here is a highly medicated client. They're on uh, Paxil and they're on the Spiritol <clears throat> and long term. Uh, here's where she started and here's where she ended and it virtually did not move. The brain is in chemical soup. So we have to, we can still treat chemically uh, individuals in this kind of situation, it just takes a lot longer. And the person wouldn't be sitting in front of us if this was an effective treatment, of course. And this is the sound we were talking about, and this is suppression of slow frequency, which is something we want to do for the elderly. And here we get nice suppression associated with listening to this harmonic. So we get anywhere from, say, 13% up to 30% suppression of that slow frequency amplitude, which sharpens brain activity. and this is an actual individual. The source is the late Dr. Budzinski uh, sent this slide to me. And here we're getting a nice suppression of theta. And this is very nice because we're getting a nice strong increase in fast alpha. So this is the best of all possible worlds for an individual concerned about age-related decline. Sit down, read, and have that harmonic playing softly in the background. And traumatic brain injuries, the other big issue we have to watch with age-related declines, and this mimics conditions like uh, attention deficit disorder, uh, age-related declines, and a lot of other things as well. So we always check for that. Is what happens with the alpha peak frequency of an untreated head injury. This is a football player and went from a huge, a very, very nice brain, efficient brain, down to a very sluggish brain uh, over a three-year period. The source of this is Dr. Gluck in Florida. Don't forget, there are some benefits of failing memory. The older we get, the better we were. Thank you, Dr. Swingo. I'll take it from here. Uh, this is the book I mentioned at the beginning of the webcast, Biofeedback for the Brain. And if you are interested in reading more about neurotherapy and how it effectively helps with many neurological conditions, this book is a must. It is available online at soundhealthproducts.com or it can be ordered at Swingo Clinic. And basic neurotherapy is a guide for clinicians. It leads them through the procedures for evaluating and treating patients with wide range of disorders. It is also available online at soundhealthproducts.com. And Swingo Clinic provides many educational activities. These include public lectures and webcasts for general public, grand round sessions, workshops, consulting services, and one-on-one -on -one trainings for professionals. Our next three-day workshop is scheduled for May 23rd to 25th, and that is the Fundamental neuro Neurotherapy Workshop. The Advanced Neurotherapy Workshop will run from October 24th to October 26th. You can see both events listed on our events page at swingleclinic.com. And these are uh, some of our upcoming webcast topics. We will be talking about treatment of ADD, anxiety, addictions, fibromyalgia, and more. We have all the webcasts scheduled on our events page at swingleclinic.com. So if you are interested in registering for any of these future topics, you can do so right at our events page. If you would like to view our previous webcasts, they are all posted on our website, swingleclinic.com. Just go on media page and then Dr. Swingle's webcast page. 
And Sound Health Products is Division of Swingo Clinic. It is the leader in research and development of products for neurotherapy and biofeedback. Many of the products, such as sound healing CDs and MP3s, are used at home as aids to enhance relaxation, sleep, and attention. Most of these products have been developed by Dr. Swingle through many years of his research and experience. You can visit Sound Health Products at www.soundhealthproducts.com and you can now like us on Sound Health Products Facebook page. You can find it at facebook.com forward slash Sound Health Products. And if you have any questions or comments about the products, feel free to email me at rita at swingleclinic.com. And this is the end of our webcast. We hope you had a good time with us and we will be back on February 22nd. Uh, Dr. Swingo will explain how to select the right home treatment product. Now, only, not only we will be covering which products are suitable for certain conditions, such as problems with maintaining concentration or focus, sleep difficulties, stress and anxiety, and so on, but Dr. Swingle will go over some data providing the efficacy of these products. If you are interested in listening, you can register for this webcast on our events page at swingleclinic.com. Have a great weekend, everybody. Bye-bye.